When Inaco Mines completed its merger with Kirkland Lake Gold earlier this year, a new number three gold miner emerged. In its rationale for the merger, Agnico touted low operational risk and environmental social governance advantages due to where it operates. You're watching Quebec in Focus, why investors need to hold Quebec resource companies. My name is Michael McRae, your moderator. Today's event is sponsored by Radisson Mining Resources. Amar Jundi is president and CEO of Agnico Eagle. Amar, welcome to Kitco. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Before we get started with Amar, this is a live and interactive event. Please submit your questions on the YouTube comment box and we'll pass your questions to Amar at the end. Now, Amar, highlight the major mining operations in the province. How important is Quebec to Agnico? Uh, you know, Michael, Quebec is our, is our home turf. Uh, you know, we've been there for decades. A lot of our employees, past and present, are from Quebec. It's a great jurisdiction. Uh, it has the geologic potential. It has the uh, political stability. And importantly, it has a, a fantastic resource of highly skilled individuals, uh, again, who make up a core of, of our company. Uh, we have three key operations uh, in Quebec right now. We have La Ronde, which is a flagship uh, mine been operating since 1988. It's been expanded five times. Uh, last quarter, just the last quarter alone, it produced over 100,000 ounces at cash costs in the mid 500. So a world-class mine by any measure. Uh, we have Goldex um, uh, generating a, in, in the neighborhood of 135,000 ounces this year. Uh, and then of course, uh, our partnership with the Amana at Canadian Malartic, which is the largest open pit mine in Canada and we'll be transitioning to the largest underground mine in Canada as the Malartic underground uh, ore body uh, comes into production. Let's talk about the uniqueness of Quebec, Amar. Uh, if you or another large miner is assessing a project in Quebec, what are some of the assumed advantages you have over another part of the world? I assume that water and hydropower would be at the top. Well, water and hydro is, is very significant because it allows us, um, Michael, not just to have lower energy costs, and, and we'll get to that in a second, but it's also green energy. And so in today's environment, it's not just uh, dollars and cents, it's how responsibly do you operate. And a big part of that is the environmental and carbon footprint. So if your electricity is almost exclusively hydro uh, and at an advantageous cost, uh, that's a big plus, especially, uh, I would say, especially uh, relative to parts of the world that are dependent on diesel uh, or fossil fuels for their electricity production, because as you can imagine, um, with fossil fuel prices literally doubling uh, over the last few months, uh, it's a big advantage uh, to have power uh, in Quebec. But, but there are, Michael, many other uh, benefits beyond uh, power and water. Um, again, the, the geologic potential, the political stability, and re-emphasize what I said earlier, just the very high quality uh, of excellent people. Talk about uh, the relationship, uh, say, with First Nations and uh, other communities around the mines. Well, you know, I, I would say our relationship with the First Nations in, uh, uh, in Quebec uh, and, and throughout everywhere we operate, um, you know, they are key partners. Um, you know, uh, they're very important, just like all the communities we work with, they are an integral part of, of what we try to do. I do think as uh, an industry uh, and as a country, frankly, uh, we can do better than we've done in the past. I think we've come a long way in the last 10 years. Uh, there's a long way to go still, uh, but we're making good progress. And, and certainly, um, frankly, we have very good relationships with all of the First Nations throughout all of our operations globally. And I would assume the communities as well. I mean, Quebec is an old mining jurisdiction, so yeah. you would have, there's like a, how would you say, there's a lot of communities that are built around mining. There's a lot of communities around mining. Uh, I'll give you a, something that really uh, sort of hit me on that point. I remember going underground at a, at a mine called Lapa uh, in Quebec, and I was talking to a really quite a brilliant young engineer, and I was, you know, quite impressed that this young fellow knew so much uh, and we got into talking and he mentioned that he's from the area and that his uh, parents and some of his grandparents uh, worked for Agnico. So, you know, it shows you not just uh, the depth of the relationship Agnico has, uh, 
uh, in the mining community in Quebec, but the depth and history of the of the mining community more broadly in Quebec. Uh, the rationale for the merger with Kirkland uh, was a company that was built uh, had built in ESG advantages. Does that message uh, resonate with investors, Mr. It does. It does. Um, Kirkland Lake did a lot of things really well, including ESG, just as Agnico does. And the combination uh, of the two companies really were world leaders uh, in the gold mining space with regards to, say, a greenhouse gas emissions, with the regards to fresh water usage. And that's very important for Agnico. It's important for our shareholders uh, and our investors. How does the Quebec government support mining, MR? Well, first and foremost, uh, I think the Quebec government is is fully aware of how important uh, mining is uh, as part of the economic development of the province and in particular, uh, some of the rural areas. And and so they have the Quebec government for decades, Michael, been very supportive of mining. Uh, They do it through um, uh, tax structures, tax advantages uh, for exploration. Uh, there, uh, There are three mining engineering schools in Quebec, uh, which are, are invaluable to companies like ourselves. Um, you know, they're, uh, they play a big part in providing the infrastructure that we talked about with regards to uh, clean electricity. Uh, so I would have to say uh, that in our experience for decades, uh, the government of Quebec uh, have been important and supportive partners in the mining industry. We talked about uh, your operations, Amar, at the start. Uh, anything that you want to highlight on the exploration pipeline for your work in Quebec? Well, I, I think it's interesting, you know, as we talk about the, the long history of, of mining in Quebec, uh, that probably one of the biggest discoveries anywhere in the world uh, has been the underground potential at Canadian Malartic. Um, you know, this is a mine uh, that, that, that's been around originally since the 50s. Uh, and it started up again as a, as a very large open pit mine. And in the last few years, we found uh, in total uh, resources, you know, 15 million ounces and counting, and it's still open. So, um, you know, you look at Laurent, we talked about Laurent, it's been expanded five times. We're putting three exploration drifts uh, into, a, into a mine, uh, you know, that's been operating for 35 years. So, it's a great jurisdiction. There is a saying, and 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 I believe in it. It says the best place to uh, to uh, find a new gold mine is in the shadow of a head frame. One of the trends with uh, what is happening with mining is is kind of the uh, interweaving of electrification and automation. Uh, that's really creating uh, how would you say changes to the way that you can uh, operate uh, mines. You do have all of that hydropower that exists uh, within Quebec. Anything that you want to highlight uh, or that you see that is exciting that's going to be hopping operationally, um, Emma? Well, I, I'm a huge believer in in um, automation, uh, autonomous, and ele- electrification, and they do go hand in hand. And let me give you a simple example on why I think electrification is going to be um, come to the mining industry much faster than people uh, expect. So Laurent, the mine that we've talked about, is three kilometers down right now. Uh, And imagine you're operating uh, diesel equipment. For every kilogram of diesel that you burn underground, you have to bring 14 kilograms of air three kilometers underground. And as that diesel uh, is combusted, uh, you now have to pump 15 kilograms of exhaust uh, up to surface from three kilometers. Uh, so there's energy cost there. In fact, our the largest electricity use at La Ronde is in ventilation. Um, you also have to cool it underground because of the diesel. So you can imagine that if you switch to to uh, uh, battery powered and electric powered vehicles, uh, you, it's not only better for the environment; it will be economically uh, uh, better as well. Now. Where are we on that? People say, why aren't you there already? The answer is we are just now uh, getting um, sort of large equipment, prototype equipment from the, from the uh, uh, large equipment manufacturers. But I do think there's going to be a revolution, Michael, in the next five or 10 years uh, where there's a lot more electric uh, equipment underground and open pit and a lot more uh, automation and autonomous vehicles. We, we are already at Laurent 
um, mucking about a third uh, 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 of our ore uh, from surface. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, we are moving in that direction very quickly. Are there any disadvantages uh, to uh, the Quebec jurisdiction for uh, mining and uh, juniors? No, I wouldn't say there are any disadvantages. I think I think you know no place is perfect, but um, you know there's a reason Quebec ranks so highly in the Fraser Institute of of uh, advantageous places to mine. Uh, I think it ranks number eight out of eighty four in the world. I would argue actually it should rank higher. So um, you know no place is perfect, but if you're going to be mining and you're looking for the geologic potential uh, and the political stability and the availability of high quality people, uh, you know, Quebec's right up near the top. Now, Amar, uh, we're at a pretty good gold price. Uh, last I checked, we're in uh, the mid 1800s right now. Talking about gold miners as a whole, not just Agnico, do you anticipate that there's going to be more acquisitions? Yeah, there will be. Uh, I, I have no doubt there will be. I, I would say there's going to be more mergers. Um, you know, it's it, this is an industry where there are probably more players than there are good quality assets. And so what you want are uh, the highest quality assets in the strongest hands. Uh, I think you're going to see uh, continued consolidation. And I think that's that's healthy for the industry. Uh, Amar, we're going to leap to the questions uh, that uh, the viewers have submitted, uh, but uh, let's just, uh, I just want to talk about the news for a sec. Uh, Goldfield wants to acquire a Yamana, which has a 50% stake in Canadian Malarctic. Do you anticipate any operational changes if the deal goes through? No, we don't. Uh, you know, Goldfield are well-known professional, uh, high-quality uh, miners. We've had nothing but good experience uh, with our partners at Yamana. And we expect post-merger we'll have nothing but good experience uh, with our new uh, partners uh, at Goldfields. Uh, talking about uh, interactive questions, uh, the first we have is uh, just talking about uh, what you the deal that you did with uh, Maple Gold Mines. Is this typical of uh, the deal? Maybe you could talk about the deal structure and uh, if that's typical in terms of what you do with juniors. It, it is typical. So typically what we do, Michael, and we've been doing this for a long time, is uh, we tend to focus on regions. Uh, you know, our, some of our competitors have a different strategy and it works for them and they'll go anywhere in the world to build a gold mine. We don't do that. What we do is we focus on specific regions in the world where one, there's the geologic potential for multiple mines over multiple decades. And two, you can actually operate multiple mines for multiple decades, which means it has to be politically stable. And, and this is again, you know why we're in places like Quebec and Ontario and Nunavut and 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 Australia and Finland and Mexico. Um, our investment in Maple is a is a structure we've used a lot, which is we get to know the juniors, uh, we get to know what they're working on, we'll take strategic positions in them, uh, and then we'll uh, frankly help them assess what they've got, and then when we make a decision whether to acquire more or to get out of the position. Uh, then, Michael, we're making that decision based on knowledge. So this is very typical of what we do, uh, and we're very happy with, with the investment. They're, they're a good team, um, uh, but it is very typical of how we approach things. I want to remind our viewers, if you do have any questions for Amar, please feel free to submit them in the comments box. Uh, and I think this goes, uh, this next question, Amar, uh, just really dovetails into what you're talking about, uh, Maple and Synergy, and then also looking at regions. Uh, is there synergies between the operations in Quebec and uh, projects and operations in Ontario? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And the answer is absolutely. Really, um... The history of mining uh, in the Abitibi Kirkland belt goes back a long way. It's frankly quite fungible. Uh, uh, you know, people have worked on both sides of the provincial border uh, for decades and decades. Uh, there are uh, synergy opportunities in procurement. Uh, you know, in, in 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 between Ontario and Quebec, we probably spend uh, you know two and a half billion dollars roughly. Uh, so there's opportunities and synergies, there's opportunities in warehousing, there's opportunities in uh, um, training, there's opportunities in, in hiring. There's a lot of opportunities uh, in synergies. And in fact, um, the majority of the roughly $2 billion of synergies that we're going to be 
generating over the next 10 years from this merger, the majority of that is in the Ontario, Quebec, none of it triangle. You uh, mentioned this uh, previously, talking about Malarctic and how you're going underground. Uh, in your uh, Q1, you were talking about uh, the great potential uh, for this. Maybe you can just talk about what that great potential is, how this uh, mine is actually changing. Well, you know, with, with um, you know, when you have an opportunity uh, uh, and you've got uh, and you've discovered upwards of 15 million ounces of resources. Uh, and the ore body is still open, uh, and you're hitting uh, what looks like it might be an extension of the same ore body a kilometer uh, away, uh, that's impressive. That's impressive, uh, Michael, by any standard anywhere in the world. But what's really impressive is if you can do that and you can leverage off of existing infrastructure, existing relationships, uh, and, and that's what we're doing here. Remember, the mill is already built. This, this giant mill uh, that will be able to handle all of this new discovery. You will never get a better risk-adjusted return on capital ever in the mining space than you will by uh, uh, expanding off of existing infrastructure. And that's what we're doing. So it's not just the fact that there's all of this gold that's been discovered. It's that uh, we'll be able to process it without having to build a new mill. And by the way, uh, this is interesting. You know, this mill uh, can handle about 60,000 tons a day because it's dealing with an open pit mine at roughly one gram. The underground is about three grams and it'll be processing about 20,000 uh, uh, tons a day. So that means that not only are we going to have the underground mine leveraging off this mill, but we're going to have in the neighborhood of 35 or 40,000 ounces, uh, uh, tons a day of spare capacity in this mill in one of the most prospective gold areas of the world. So even the mill then will have uh, more potential. It, it really shows you the benefit of focusing on a region that has a lot of gold um, and leveraging off the existing infrastructure and people that you have in place. Molly asks, uh, are there gonna be any more major new discoveries in Quebec? Oh yes, well, 100%. Uh, again, interestingly, uh, and I'll just use this as an example. When you talk about the Malartic Underground, remember this mine's been around from the 50s, and last year, last year it won the uh, 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 Best Exploration Discovery uh, Award. So um, there are absolutely going to be, and, and in fact, I would say that uh, a very high percentage of new discoveries anywhere in the world over the last few years uh, have been in Quebec. I think that's a good place to leave it, Amar. Thank you, Michael. It's always a pleasure. Have a great day. He is Amar al -Jindi. He is CEO of Agnico Eagle. Up next, we have a panel of industry experts to talk about investing in Quebec from the junior perspective. Quebec Mining Focus is sponsored by Radisson Mining Resources. Radisson is advancing its 100% owned O'Brien project, one of the highest grade undeveloped gold projects in America. O'Brien is situated in a prolific gold camp in Abitibi, Quebec. The camp has produced 25 million ounces of gold in the past 100 years. Once again, that is Radisson Mining Resources. And we thank them for their support. Many major gold miners have significant operations in Quebec, but how does the province look from the viewpoint of the juniors? I have two experts to discuss. Michael Gentile is considered one of the leading strategic investors in the junior sector, owning significant positions in over 15 small cap mining companies. Gentile is a strategic advisor to Arizona Metals and Geomega Resources. He is also director at Raskan Gold, Solstice Gold, Northern Superior Resources, and Radisson Mining Resources. Troy Beaujolais is CEO of Murchison Minerals, a Canadian-based critical mineral explorer with projects in Quebec and Saskatchewan. Before joining Murchison, Troy held executive positions with Nexon Energy. He was also chief geologist at Cameco's Eagle Point Mine. Gentlemen, Quebec is an old mining jurisdiction. Is there anything left to discover, Michael? I want to start with you. Yeah, I think there's there's tons of examples uh, over the years of, of mines that have been neglected or thought the left for dead where you found millions of ounces uh, either adjacent or below the existing pits or underworking. So Quebec is, is ripe with opportunity. 
um, either in and around existing mines, I'm involved in a few projects like that, or in brand new kind of grassroots areas that have seen limited exploration where uh, Troy and Murchison Minerals are involved in. So absolutely, I think there's a huge amount of opportunity left in Quebec, modern geoscience, uh, a lot of things are undercover, would not be able to discover it under old geo geophysical techniques, uh, infrastructure, you know, roads, uh, power that didn't exist. Quebec has done a fantastic job developing infrastructure, especially in the north, again, where, where Troy is operating Murchison Minerals. So yeah, there's tons of opportunity left in terms of the upside in Quebec and undiscovered potential of Quebec. I'm a firm believer in the best is yet to come for Quebec. Troy, I think uh, Michael set you up there. Is more discovering Quebec? Uh, absolutely. You know, Quebec, Quebec is a massive province. It's about, you know, 1.7 million square kilometers. That's about 20% of the continental US or just slightly less than Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba combined. You know, 90% of Quebec is, you know, Precambrian rocks of the Canadian Shield. This is a fantastic assemblage, you know, to work in to discover precious metals, critical minerals. Um, and, you know, with this landmass outside of the current mining jurisdiction, it, it's virtually unexplored. So we feel very strongly about the exploration potential at our HBM project and, and are advancing it um, in a way to, uh, to leverage that potential. Now, Michael, uh, as we noted at uh, the start, uh, you are a strategic investor. You have uh, positions in uh, 15 companies that you're helping out with. Um, if a junior company is focused on Quebec, what are some generalities that you can make about that company versus it being focused on another part of the world? Yeah, I'm, I'm invested all over the world. I definitely have a bit of a home bias. I am from Quebec, and I do appreciate the, the benefits of investing in Quebec. So if you're investing in Quebec, one, depending on where you are, but more than likely you'll have above average, above average infrastructure. So you'll be able to access the project more easily than you would be in other parts of the world. Uh, two, as you probably know, Quebec is the lowest cost hydropower jurisdiction in the world. So if you do make a discovery and you need hydropower, you probably have the cheapest, cheapest and cleanest power source globally to help fuel that mine. Um, three, you probably have a very skilled and educated workforce. So local geologists, engineers, drillers, the service industry is very well developed in Quebec. So you'll have high quality service companies and, and, and staff at modest costs because of the, the strong developed nature of the industry. And fourthly, you'll have very strong government support. So the government, uh, you know, relative to the rest of the world is, is very pro-mining, obviously very sensitive to the environment, but the rules are clear on the permitting side. They have some significant tax advantages. I don't know if Troy wants to talk about as an issuer, but they have tax credits for investors to invest in exploration. And in general, their, their First Nation um, agreements or partnerships are, are above average versus the rest of Canada in terms of the, the partnership and the communication that goes on with the First Nation. So very advantageous area to work um, on, on a global scale. I put it in the top five easily uh, places to mine to explore in the world. Uh, Troy, you have an easy uh, comparison there because uh, you have uh, the projects in Saskatchewan and then you also have the projects in Quebec with Murchison. Yeah, yeah, you bet. You know, Saskatchewan is is a is a very good jurisdiction in and of itself. But you know, with respect to Quebec um, and, and infrastructure, for example, you know, in the region that we're working, um, the HPM project that's in eastern Quebec on the north shore of the St. Lawrence River, you know, just right in that area, there are two rail lines providing access to year-round ports. Um, you know, there's well-maintained highways, there's commercial airports. Um, and something we've touched on already and, and probably mo as meaningful as anything is the vast supply of hydroelectricity, you know, net zero, zero carbon hydroelectric capacity, uh, wh which is very, very significant. And then from a, you know, a, a financial perspective and an incentive perspective, um, the, uh, the mining tax credit, which is right around 38%, um, that as, as a junior issuer, um, we are able to flow through to investors, which makes investing in Quebec exploration companies extremely attractive. We have seen with uh, juniors uh, that are out of uh, Quebec, Troy, uh, that they've really been leading with environmental social governance. And you just uh, touched on that uh, with uh, all the hydroelectric. And then uh, obviously also probably uh, there's a lot of brownfield advantages there as well, too. Absolutely. Uh, anything else that you can, what uh, investors like to expand upon uh, with uh, environmental uh, social governance? So, Troy, uh, is there other issues just around, I, I would say, like maybe uh, for like community relations? 
Certainly, you know, ESG in general, environmental social governance is at the forefront right now, and it's at the forefront of, of people's investment mindset. You know, events over the past few years, ranging from co the COVID pandemic through to the you know Russian invasion of Ukraine, have highlighted the importance of jurisdiction, um, and particularly as it relates to supply chains. You know, additionally, you know, investors, consumers, companies. You know, have certainly become increasingly more informed of the need for responsible and sustainably sourced critical minerals to support the current energy transition that we're in right now. You know, Quebec, as a jurisdiction from an ESG perspective, you know, it has a very stable government where the rule of law is well established and well upheld. Uh, so, from a sovereignty perspective, it, it's very, very positive. You know, that there's a robust, well documented regulatory process, you know, and that includes life cycle, you know, right from exploration through to, you know, development uh, operations and, and through closures. So, full life, life cycle process. Um, you know, Quebec certainly recognizes the rights of Indigenous peoples. Uh, and then, in turn, you know, has you know well documented examples uh, of where uh, the resource development industry and projects have mutually beneficial uh, agreements in place that support you know the development and participation of, of indigenous communities in mining projects. Um, and, you know, getting back to the infrastructure piece, you know, from an ESG perspective, you focus on the east side of that and uh, the hydroelectric uh you know potential there cannot be overstated it has a real potential for early stage projects to have a look through into uh becoming a net zero type producer which um certainly in the battery metal space and in the critical mineral space is very important uh michael gentile with your experience in quebec could you talk a little bit about uh, the communities where uh the um juniors as well as the miners operate uh, just uh, typically what are they dealing with uh, how receptive are people to mining and in general, I mean, I'm involved in Radisson Mining, which is in the Cadillac uh, Belt, one of the most prospective, uh, famous regions of Quebec. You know, in, in the Chape, Shibugama region, I'm also involved with Northern Superior Resources. These are two areas that really, you know, were built around mining. So the communities themselves are, are grateful for the mining industry, create a lot of jobs, create a lot of wealth. And so the communities in general, I'm speaking in general terms, obviously there's outliers everywhere, but in general are quite supportive of the mining industry in those two camps because it's been really the lifeblood of those those communities over the years in terms of the jobs and employment and opportunity what it also does michael is you know, you know in your project if you're in a more remote area you got to set up a camp you know especially if you're getting to more advanced you know permitting stages of a project so you know creating your own camp and, and logistics and that's very very expensive and a lot of these more established mining regions of quebec you can get geologists drill workers engineers uh Miners can drive to the site and then drive home and sleep in their own bed with their family at night, 25, 30 minute drive away from site. That, that dramatically lowers your costs. It also dramatically improves uh, the quality of the workforce you can attract. So then those established areas, I'd say in general, they're quite supportive uh, of, of mining. There's always a few that are not, but in general, they're very supportive of it. In, in the newer areas, again, the Quebec government is very supportive in opening up those new frontier areas for exploration, uh, engaging more proactively with the First Nations earlier on in, in the, the life cycle of exploration and discovery. So in general, there aren't many no-fly zones or no-go no areas in Quebec for, for mining, which is why it's such an attractive uh, jurisdiction to get involved in. What are some disadvantages to working in Quebec, Michael? You know, I'd say one thing I, I've been with two companies involved in Radisson and North Superior, the, 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 because it's such an advantageous area, Michael, I'd say that the and the, the cost of capital is lower because you have these tax incentives from the government, you have government support for exploration. In general, there's there's too many mining companies, in my opinion, in Quebec. So you have too many small companies, you know, three, four, five million dollar market cap. You might have 30 companies in an area that should have four or five. And so I've been trying to take a leading role with North Superior. We just did an acquisition of Genesis Metals and with Radisson did an acquisition in 2021 of consolidating these camps, of not having 30 companies trying to spend a million dollars a year in a camp, but have four or five companies with a 10 or $15 million budget. That can dramatically improve the quality of the outcomes for investors and attract better quality pools of capital. Um, you know, other disadvantages would be, you know, obviously cycles. I mean, the, the, the great place to work, but if the commodity prices fall off a cliff and they're back into a bear market for commodities, it make, makes it harder to move projects forward. Um, but in general, I see a very, you know, very supportive, very positive place to work in Quebec from a mining perspective. Troy, uh, can you talk about uh, trends in uh, strategic metals and uh, highlight what is uh, going on in Quebec? Um, I mean, there's a really there's a couple of companies that have come to the fore, either in the graphite space or the lithium space, and certainly in the copper space as well too. And the work uh, that you're doing with uh, Murchison. Yeah, so you know, graphite, copper, lithium, 
you know, I, I would certainly also include uh, nickel, uh, our top of mind as it relates to, uh, you know, strategic metals or critical minerals, you know, in, but Canada, the critical minerals list also includes, you know, 31 other materials that are critical uh, to Canada. And based off our early discussion with the, uh, you know, the vast landmass, uh, which Quebec has, that is virtually unexplored, you know, I think the potential across the board when you look kind of up and down uh, on the critical minerals list, it's, it's very material. You know, with that said, you know, as you mentioned, there are a few examples of projects in Quebec that are currently advancing strategic metals projects. You know, for example, Namaska Lithium is advancing their lithium project, um, you know, in, in northern Quebec. Uh, Novo Mon Graphite uh, is advancing a graphite project just north of Montreal. It, you know, that also includes uh, processing facilities, et cetera. And, you know, recently, Osisco Metals is reestablishing the Gas Bay Copper Mine located, you know, near uh, Murdochville. And so, you know, I believe that the fundamental kind of all the fundamental economic drivers uh, for the exploration and development of critical minerals um, are, are really favorable and they're really robust. Um, and uh, Quebec um, as a whole uh, has the potential to be at the forefront of that. Michael, uh, you're talking uh, previously about uh, there being uh, maybe uh, Quebec might be overly loved. Um, could you see any other thing that might potentially hold the Quebec resource sector back? You know, I think right now the the permitting regime is relatively clear and straightforward. Uh, the environmental regulations are stringent, but they're you're able to follow them in a, in a sensical, logical way. I think a change in in approach from the government, where you complicate, you know, environmental permitting timelines, uh, where the government becomes less supportive of mining if you remove the fiscal incentives um the, like you're seeing in latin america in a lot of these countries where they're increasing the the government take or taxes on these projects also increasing the risk of permitting moving forward you know michael what investors hate is lack of certainty right they're willing to take expiration risk they're willing to take commodity risk what they really dislike is if they find a project where they make a major discovery and there's certain timelines or expectations the government's supposed to follow and those end up being delayed by three, four, five years. That's when capital tends to flee a sector uh, and, and doesn't come back for a long period of time. So I think the message the government would be is continue doing what you're doing, continue to give companies like Murchison Minerals and Radisson or Spear clear marching orders and rules to follow on how to move projects forward in a systematic way, keep those supports in place. And I think capital will continue to flow in especially on a relative basis, Michael, where you look at other jurisdictions getting more and more difficult to operate. You know, Quebec is, is going to be attracting more and more wallet share over time as those other countries become less desirable. So there's a huge opportunity, like Troy said, for Quebec to really be a leader, both on the, on the EV metals and the precious metal side and supply some of these desperately needed commodities to the world in, in a clean, environmentally uh, safe way. Troy? Yeah, no, uh, just echoing, uh, e echoing Michael's sentiment. You know, I, I think the for us, we look at what the what that base threshold is um, in terms of the expectations uh, and conditions around the development of a project. You know, that that high environmental standard, which already sets the benchmark, and then the ability to leverage off that and, and move projects forward, move exploration forward um, in in a jurisdiction. And really, it is about you know, what we look forward to and what we look to in Quebec um, it is that uh, it is a process that is that is well outlined, that is clear, that is transparent, and that you can navigate through uh, and move through very predictably. Um, and uh, so, you know, that, that's just an overlay of an advantage um, in Quebec, but, you know, an erosion of that certainly would not be good. Michael, I think you mentioned one of these. Uh, I'm just going to close on this question. Uh, what's going to be most impactful to Quebec and mining over the years forward? Is it going to be ESG advantages? Is it going to be uh, technology? Is it going to be cashed up seniors seeking safe mining jurisdiction? Or is it going to be the need for battery metals and new mines being built in Quebec? That's a pretty good checklist. I'd probably say all of the above, Michael. But what I would <laughs> say would be the war in Ukraine, uh, while very unfortunate, has you know refocused the senior mining company's attention on security of supply and jurisdictional risk. And so Quebec is doing a very good job on infrastructure, as you mentioned earlier, roads, power, opening up new areas. They're also looking to vertically integrate. Look what they're doing in the, in the EV metal space is to have the whole food chain from discovery all the way to final production of the batteries themselves. And so if you're a producer or your auto, auto manufacturer or a big, large mining company, 
like I said earlier, those permitting clarity of rules and process and procedure and unchangeability of those and having certainty of investment timelines are critical for majors when they want to make big investments in Quebec. So what I think is going to happen is a wallet share is going to increase, like I said earlier, money fund flows coming into Quebec versus other jurisdictions that might have got those fund flows in the past. And Quebec can keep doubling down that advantage by making it you know, more efficient and easier for companies to invest and navigate those, those challenges in, in Quebec versus other jurisdictions. Troy, choose your top trend. Yeah, I, I look at I, I look at the structural deficit um, when it when it relates to uh, you know the supply of critical minerals moving forward. Um, I, I look at where Quebec is positioned um, in terms of the potential. Uh, I, I look at the the regulatory. Uh, process that that's in place, the stability of the jurisdiction, um, and, and then technically, just you know, for for ourselves in particular, where where we're at at the stage of our project technically, and be able, you know, being able to accelerate that um, through um, through the efficient, you know, means of raising capital from the, some of the incentives in the province, and you know, I, I think all those things really stack up. Um, and ha have certainly attracted us to Quebec, and, and it's a place that we intend to uh, continue to, uh, to explore uh, and develop projects in. That has been Quebec in Focus. I want to thank Amar Aljundi, Michael Gentile, Troy Beaujolais. My name is Michael McRae. Thanks to our sponsor, Radisson Mining Resources. On behalf of Keiko Mining, have a pleasant afternoon.